Welcome to Aeronet's Visual Simulation Training Program for the Airbus A320. The A320 is a narrow-body, twin-engine, subsonic, short-to-medium-range civil transport aircraft. The use of advanced technology and construction, such as composite materials, has resulted in an aircraft with unmatched fuel efficiency, reduced maintenance costs, and increased reliability. The aircraft is controlled by a computer-managed fly-by-wire system, which offers protection against exceeding the normal flight envelope. The A320 is manufactured by Airbus Industry, a consortium of four European aerospace companies. Fuselage sections, the tail section, flaps, and spoilers are made by Daimler Benz Aerospace Airbus in Germany. British Aerospace in England is responsible for the main wing section. CASA of Spain builds the horizontal stabilizers and elevators, nose landing gear doors, and forward cabin entry doors. Aerospatiale of France constructs the cockpit, forward fuselage, and engine pylons. The engines come from CFM International. All the components are shipped to Toulouse, France, where final assembly takes place. Airbus has modified a cargo aircraft entirely for this purpose. The Beluga A300-600ST Super Transporter is based on an A300-600 and is large enough to carry a fuselage section or two complete A320 wings. The CFM 56-5A engine mounted on the A320 is a high bypass turbofan engine producing 25,000 pounds of thrust at sea level. It is produced by CFM International, a joint venture between Senecma of France and GE Aircraft Engines of the USA. The engine core based on the GE F-101 engine installed on the Rockwell B-1B bomber, is manufactured in Cincinnati, and the low-pressure system is manufactured by Senecma in Villarouche, France, where final assembly takes place. The cockpit is designed for a two-man crew operation and also has seats for up to two observers. The cabin layout can be modified to suit the operator's requirements. It is certified for a maximum of 180 seats. There are two large cargo compartments and one bulk baggage compartment under the main cabin floor of the aircraft. The cargo floor is fitted with an automatic ULD loading system where the aircraft can be delivered without this system and cargo must then be manually loaded and secured with nets. The bulk compartment area is for manual loading only. The aircraft is pressurized for passenger and crew comfort, except for the nose cone section where the radar antenna is housed, the nose and main landing gear bays, the air conditioning compartment, and the tail cone section where the APU is installed. The A320 aircraft is 123 feet 3 inches long, 38 feet 7 inches high to the top of the tail, and 111 feet 10 inches wide, wingtip to wingtip. The steerable nose wheel is controlled by two algebraically interconnected steering hand wheels located on the captain and first officer's side consoles, which can steer the nose wheel up to 75 degrees in either direction. The steering system is also fly-by-wire with no direct mechanical linkage between the hand wheels and the nose wheel. The minimum radius dimensions are displayed. Note the green arc that the wing describes forward of the aircraft nose. The antennas for the navigation and communication equipment are installed at various locations on the aircraft. 
The various ground service connections and access panels are shown on the screen. The A320 cockpit is designed for two flight crew members. System controls are arranged for ease of use and monitoring by both crew members. The pilot's instrument panels have six identical and interchangeable display units, or DUs, which display flight parameter and navigation data, engine and systems parameters, and warning and caution messages. The center pedestal contains, among other things, the multi-purpose control and display units, the thrust levers and manual trim wheels, speed brake and flap levers, and radio communication panels. The overhead panel, which includes the overhead circuit breaker panel, is arranged to make extensive use of push-button switches containing status and failure indications. These indications follow a color code. Normal indications are shown in green and in blue for a temporary normal operation of a system. A push-button switch will show a white indication for an abnormal switch position, a test result, or for maintenance information. Cautions are amber and indicate a failure that the crew should be aware of, but does not necessarily call for immediate action. Warnings are red and indicate a failure needing immediate action. The design philosophy is that when the aircraft is configured normally, all overhead push-button switch lights should be off. Only green lights can be permanently on when required, and blue lights should be illuminated only temporarily. The pilot seat may be adjusted horizontally or vertically using either the electrical or the mechanical seat adjustment. The seat can be reclined manually, and the lumbar cushion can be moved vertically and horizontally. There is a five-point quick-release seat belt and a lock-unlock lever for the shoulder harness. The outboard armrest, aligned with the side stick, may be adjusted for height using the side knurled knob or adjusted for pitch using the front knurled knob. The armrest also has a position indicator window, which displays the pitch and height as a letter-number combination so that a comfortable position can be remembered. The inboard armrest may be adjusted in the vertical by pushing in the locking lever on the end of the armrest. A fully adjustable table is installed in front of each pilot. Airbus SOP calls for the table to be stowed for takeoff and landing. Your airline policy may differ. The cockpit has two fixed windshields, two sliding side windows, and two fixed side windows. All windows are heated. The maximum speed limitation with the cockpit window open is 200 knots. The sliding windows can be used as crew emergency exits. To open the window, the unlocking button is pressed, then the control handle is pulled inward and rearward. With the window in the open position, the locking pin will prevent it from moving forward. To close the window, the locking pin lever is moved aft and the control handle is pushed to the fully forward position. Sun visors are installed in front of each pilot. In addition, semi-transparent reflective roller type sun blinds are installed on all side windows. Located in the right rear corner of the flight deck, behind the first officer, is the emergency equipment, manual stowage, and the third occupant seat. The seat is normally stowed in a vertical position. For use, the seat unlock lever is raised, and the seat is moved sideways while lowering the seat bottom cushion to a position in the middle of the cockpit. The seat will lock in place when it reaches the end of its track travel. The headrest can then be raised and locked in place. Located in the left rear corner of the flight deck 
is the coat and hat stowage area, emergency equipment, spare light bulbs and fuse stowage compartment, aircraft manual storage, and the fourth occupant seat. The seat simply folds out of the wall into a horizontal position. It is stowed by lifting the seat bottom back into the vertical. Oxygen masks are installed in a compartment adjacent to each pilot. There are two masks in each compartment, one for the pilot and one for an observer seated in the cockpit. The captain and first officer's life jackets are stowed in a compartment on their respective seat backs. The third and fourth occupant's life jackets are stowed in a compartment below their seats. A portable flashlight is stowed at each pilot station in a holder near the floor. There are four plug-type passenger doors on the A320 that open outward and forward parallel to the aircraft. There are two on each side of the fuselage at the forward and aft ends of the passenger cabin. The doors are normally operated manually from either the inside or the outside of the aircraft. Each door is also fitted with an emergency escape slide. The passenger door is opened normally from the inside by raising the door control handle, which unlocks the door. The door moves slightly inwards and upwards and can then be pushed outwards to its fully opened position. A gust lock will engage when the door is in the fully opened position. A hydraulic damper actuator installed on the door dampens door travel, especially in windy conditions. To close the door, the gust lock push button is pressed to release the gust lock, and using the door assist handle, the door is pulled inwards. Then the door control handle is moved down to the locked position. Touch the play button to play the video. The passenger door is opened normally from the inside by raising the door control handle which unlocks the door. The door moves slightly inwards and upwards and can then be pushed outwards to its fully opened position. A gust lock will engage when the door is in the fully opened position. A hydraulic damper actuator installed on the door dampens door travel, especially in windy conditions. To close the door, the gust lock push button is pressed to release the gust lock, and using the door assist handle, the door is pulled inwards. Then the door control handle is moved down to the locked position. Touch the play button to play the video. Each passenger door has a mechanical indicator at the top of the door to show whether the door is locked or unlocked. When the door is locked, the word locked in green is visible in the indicator window. When unlocked, the indicator changes to unlocked in red. An escape slide is stowed in a container attached to the inside bottom of each door. To arm the slide, the arming lever is moved down to the armed position, which connects the slide girt bar to floor brackets on both sides of the door. An indicator on the slide arming lever shows armed in red when the slide is engaged. With the slide armed, when the door control handle is raised in an emergency, the hydraulic damper actuator, normally used to dampen door movement, automatically opens the door by releasing gas stored in the cylinder into the actuator. As the door opens, the slide automatically inflates in about three and a half seconds. A crew member can manually inflate the slide using the manual inflation handle if the automatic operation does not work. Touch the play button to play the video. To disarm the slide, the slide arming lever is moved up to the disarm position and the slide disarmed indication will now be shown in green. An installed safety pin and flag is removed from its stowage position and inserted into the arming lever to prevent accidental movement of the slide arming lever. 
in the event of an emergency water landing, the slide may be disconnected from the aircraft using the disconnect handle. A lanyard connecting the slide to the aircraft frame must be cut after the slide has been disconnected to allow the slide to float clear of the aircraft. The slide may now be used as an emergency life raft. When opening the door from the outside, push in the flap and grasp the handle. Raise the handle all the way up to the horizontal green line. This action unlocks the door and disarms the escape slide if it was armed. The door may now be pulled out to its fully opened position. Touch the play button to play the video. There is a white slide armed light that will illuminate if the door control handle is moved, warning the crew that the escape slide is still armed. In addition, there is a red flashing cabin pressure light that warns the crew if there is residual pressure in the cabin after the engines have been shut down and the slide has been disarmed. Do not attempt to open the door until after this light goes out and all residual cabin pressure has dissipated. Both of these lights are visible through the window from the outside of the aircraft. There are two plug type emergency exits over the wing on both sides of the cabin. These exits can be opened from inside or outside the aircraft and may be used in case of emergency evacuation in addition to the regular cabin doors. Each door weighs about 15 kilograms. To open the overwing emergency exit, first remove the handle cover. The internal handle light and slide armed indicator will illuminate. Pull on the handle and the emergency window exit will fall inwards. Lift the exit out of the frame using the handle and the grip mold and throw the exit out onto the wing. There is one dual lane escape slide stored in a fuselage compartment near the trailing edge of each wing that will automatically deploy when an overwing emergency exit is opened. The slides are always armed However, if the slide fails to deploy, a manual inflation handle located in the upper left corner of the opened emergency exit window can be pulled to manually deploy the slide. Touch the play button to play the video. The door that separates the cockpit from the passenger cabin normally opens inwards to the cockpit. In an emergency, it can be forced open in either direction. It is possible to lock the cockpit door by moving the manual lock down to the red position. The door can then be unlocked from a pilot seat by pressing the door unlock push button on the center pedestal. To cancel the locking feature, move the manual lock up to the green position. There are two sliding side windows in the cockpit that can be used as emergency exits for the flight crew. Above each window in a small ceiling compartment is an escape rope that is long enough to reach the ground through either window. The cockpit windows can be opened from the inside only. There are a total of three cargo doors, all installed on the right-hand side of the aircraft. The forward and aft cargo doors open outward and upward using pressure supplied by the yellow hydraulic system. These doors can be opened from the outside only. If the yellow hydraulic system pump fails, a crewman can use a hand pump on the hydraulic maintenance panel to pressurize the system and open or close the doors. When the main cargo doors are correctly locked, a green mark is visible through small circular viewing windows along the bottom edge of each door to indicate that the cams of the safety mechanism are engaged with the door locking hooks. The door to the bulk cargo area is a plug type door that manually opens inward and upward. It may be opened from the outside or the inside.
there are four inward opening plug type doors which provide access to the avionic compartments. These doors are located on the lower fuselage near the nose landing gear bay. Door indications are displayed on the ECAM door page. A rectangular symbol in green represents each door when it is closed and locked. When a door is unlocked, the door indication turns amber with a corresponding amber label to indicate the type of door that is open. The slide legend appears in white when the emergency escape slide is armed. An ECAM caution is generated whenever a door is opened with at least one engine running. The cockpit is illuminated by both integral panel lights and external flood and background lights. The intensity of all lights can be controlled. There are two overhead dome lights to illuminate the general cockpit area. The integral light knob, located on the pedestal light panel, adjusts the intensity of the integral lighting for the main instrument panel and the center pedestal panel. This knob also turns the lights on and off. The overhead integral light knob on the overhead panel adjusts the intensity of the integral lighting for the overhead instrument panel. This knob also turns the lights on and off. The enunciator light switch on the overhead panel has three positions. In the test position, it illuminates all flight deck enunciator lights and displays eights in the liquid crystal display units. In the dim position, the enunciator lights are powered with reduced voltage for a lower light level. In the bright position, the enunciator lights function normally. The dome light switch has three positions. In the bright setting, both dome lights are on bright. In the dim setting, both dome lights are on dim. And in the off setting, both dome lights are off. In the emergency electrical configuration, the right dome light will illuminate if the switch is in the dim or bright position. The console floor switches on the captain and first officer's lighting panel turn the side console and briefcase lights on bright, dim, or off. The left switch under the glare shield controls the brightness of the integral lights on the glare shield and the LEDs on the FCU. The right switch adjusts the brightness of the FCU displays. The standby compass light switch on the overhead lighting panel turns the integral light for the standby compass light on and off. Both the captain and first officer have a reading light mounted near the forward upper corner of their respective sliding windows. The control knob turns the light on and off and adjusts the intensity of the light while a sliding lever adjusts the diameter of the light beam. When the swiveling light is pushed back into its housing, power is turned off automatically. The two cockpit overhead reading lights have a control knob to turn the light on and off and adjust the intensity of the light. Four zones of the pilot's instrument panel can be illuminated with floodlights. The captain's far left side, the first officer's far right side, and the center instrument panel over the standby instruments and over the landing gear handle. In the emergency electrical configuration, the captain's left and center instrument panel floodlights over the standby instruments will illuminate if the main floodlight knob is on. The pedestal floodlight knob controls the floodlight to the center pedestal. It can be swiveled slightly. There are separate lighting controls for each of the six display units. Each knob adjusts the intensity of the screen and turns it on or off. On the control for the nav display unit, the outer concentric knob controls the intensity of the radar return picture 
that is superimposed on the nav display screen when the radar set is turned on. Each MCDU has its own light control knob on the upper right side of the keyboard. The aircraft exterior lights are all controlled by switches located on the overhead exterior lighting panel. The beacon switch turns the top and bottom flashing red anti-collision lights on and off. The wing switch turns on and off two lights on either side of the fuselage. These lights are focused on the wing leading edge and the engine air intakes. They may be used to help determine if ice is building up on those areas. Two sets of navigation lights are installed in each of the wing tips and tail cone and are controlled by the nav and logo light switch. Position 1 turns on the first set of lights, and position 2 turns on the second set. The vertical stabilizer logo lights located on top of the horizontal stabilizer come on with the switch in position 1 or 2 when the aircraft is on the ground or in flight with the slats extended. Two lights installed on the nose gear strut are controlled by the nose light switch. The taxi position turns on the taxi light only. The takeoff position turns on both the taxi and the takeoff lights. The off position turns off both lights. These lights will also go off when the landing gear is retracted regardless of switch position. There is a retractable landing light installed under each wing inboard of the engines. The left and right landing light selectors have three positions. The on position will extend the landing light and turn it on when fully extended. The off position selects the landing light off but leaves it extended. The retract position retracts the landing light and turns the light off. The upper ECAM memo display will show landing light in green when one landing light is extended. There is no speed restriction for landing light operation but some light airframe vibration will be felt above speeds of 250 knots. Two runway turnoff lights are installed on the nose gear strut at fixed angles. The runway turnoff switch will turn the two lights on and off. They will also go out when the landing gear is retracted regardless of switch position. The strobe light switch has three positions. In the on position, the three synchronized strobe lights installed on the two wing tips and the tail cone will flash white. In the auto position, the lights will flash whenever the aircraft is in flight. The off position turns these lights off. If the switch is in the off position in flight, the memo display on the upper ECAM will indicate strobe light off in green. The Aircraft Emergency Lighting System will assist passengers in the event of an emergency evacuation. The Emergency Lighting System is comprised of floor proximity escape path lighting, exit signs, overhead cabin emergency lights, exit location signs, lavatory lights, and overwing escape route and escape slide lighting. The floor proximity emergency escape path lights will illuminate a path to all exit doors. The lights are installed on a number of seats at floor level on the left side of the aisle. Exit marker lights are associated with the escape path lighting system. They are mounted on the wall near floor level at all six emergency exit doors. Fourteen overhead low-voltage emergency lights are mounted underneath the overhead luggage compartments and over each main cabin door to ensure continuous illumination of the aisle. 
Four exit location signs are located on the cabin ceiling by each door area, and an exit sign is mounted on the wall above each main door and above each pair of emergency exits. There is an auxiliary light mounted in the ceiling of each lavatory. These lights are always on when the aircraft has electrical power. The overwing exterior lights are located under the overwing exits and will automatically come on when one of the armed exits is opened. The escape slides are also supplied with integral lighting strips along the sides, which come on automatically when the slide is deployed. The emergency exit light switch on the overhead panel has three detents. In the off detent, the emergency lights are off and will not come on, and the off light next to the switch illuminates. In the armed detent, the emergency lights come on if the normal aircraft electrical power fails. With the switch in the on position, all emergency lights will come on. Lifting the guard and pressing the emergency light push button on the forward flight attendant's panel will also turn on all emergency lights. On the ground, once an evacuation is ordered, the engines are shut down, and normal aircraft electrical power is lost, the emergency lighting system will be powered by four emergency power supply units, each having integral rechargeable batteries, which will power the system for at least 12 minutes. The fasten seatbelt signs and the no smoking signs are controlled by separate switches in the cockpit. The no smoking switch has three positions. When selected to on, the no smoking and exit signs in the cabin come on and a single low tone chime sounds. The message, no smoking in green, is displayed on the memo section of the upper ECAM screen when the signs are on. In the auto position, the no smoking and exit signs and the chime come on automatically when the landing gear is extended and go off when the landing gear is retracted. If selected to off, the signs will extinguish and a single low tone chime sounds again. The seatbelt switch has three positions. When selected on, the fastened seatbelt signs at each passenger service unit and the return to seat signs in each lavatory comes on and a single low tone chime sounds throughout the cabin. The message, seatbelts in green, is displayed on the memo section of the upper ECAM screen when the signs are on. In the auto position, the signs and the tone will come on whenever the aircraft is on the ground and automatically in flight when the flaps lever is selected to config one or the landing gear is extended. If the switch is selected off, the signs are extinguished and a single low tone chime sounds again. In the event of cabin depressurization, the no smoking, fastened seat belt, and exit signs will automatically come on regardless of switch position when the cabin altitude reaches approximately 11,000 feet. The interior cabin lights are controlled by the push buttons on the forward flight attendant's panel. There are separate controls for entry lights, general cabin lights, lavatory lights, attendant working area lights, and passenger seat reading lights. Over each set of passenger seats is an individual on-off switch for each reading light. The water and waste system is comprised of a potable water system, a wastewater system, and a toilet system. The potable water system supplies potable water to the two galleys and the three lavatory sinks and toilet flush mechanisms. It is stored in one 200-liter tank located in the pressurized area just ahead of the right wing and behind the forward cargo compartment. The potable water system 
is pressurized to provide a positive water flow at all times. In flight, the system utilizes engine bleed air. On the ground, it could use bleed air from the APU or for maintenance purposes, air from an external compressor unit attached to the ground pressurization port. Potable water from the tank flows to the forward galley, the forward lavatory sink and forward toilet flush system, the aft galley, and the two aft lavatory sinks and aft toilet flush systems. The water lines run under the passenger cabin floor. They are insulated, shrouded, and in places electrically heated to prevent water line freezing. There are manual shutoff valves located under each lavatory sink, toilet assembly, and galley unit. They can be used to isolate each of these components from the water system in the event of a water leak and are easily identifiable by open and shut labels. A water heater is installed in the supply line for each of the three lavatory wash basins. It is located inside the sanitary unit cabinet. A thermostat maintains the hot water temperature between 45 and 48 degrees Celsius. It incorporates an over-temperature safety device to protect the unit from overheating. Filling and draining of the potable water system is performed on the ground by the aircraft service personnel at the service panels on the bottom of the aircraft. The forward flight attendant's panel indicates the quantity of water in the potable water tank when the indicator on push button is pressed. The water system depress switch, when pressed, releases pressure in the system and drains all water back into the potable water tank. It is used to stop a leak and to drain the system when parking the aircraft for extended periods during cold weather. The wastewater system utilizes cabin differential pressure to discharge wastewater in flight. The forward galley and lavatory basin drain overboard through the forward drain mast. The rear galley and two rear lavatory basins are drained overboard through the rear drain mast. The drain masts are heated electrically to prevent any ice formation. The lavatory basins each have a drain stopper assembly and an air stopper valve. When the basin is drained, the water collects in the lines upstream of the closed air stop valve. When a set amount of wastewater is collected upstream of the air stop valves, the valves will then automatically open and the water will vent overboard through the drain mass. This is done to prevent a continuous leakage of cabin pressurization through the drain lines. Potable water is used to flush and remove waste from each toilet bowl. At altitudes above 16,000 feet, differential pressure moves waste from the toilet bowl to the waste holding tank. At lower altitudes and on the ground, a vacuum generator produces the necessary differential pressure required to move the waste through the waste lines to the waste tank. If the flush valve fails in the open position, cabin pressure will vent through the waste line to the waste tank and then overboard. The manual waste shutoff valve, located on the right-hand side of the toilet bowl at floor level, is used as a backup to close off Potable water is used to flush and remove waste from each toilet bowl. At altitudes above 16,000 feet, differential pressure moves waste from the toilet bowl to the waste holding tank. At lower altitudes and on the ground, a vacuum generator produces the necessary differential pressure required to move the waste through the waste lines to the waste tank. If the flush valve fails in the open position, Cabin pressure will vent through the waste line to the waste tank and then overboard. The manual waste shutoff valve, located on the right-hand side of the toilet bowl at floor level, is used as a backup to close off the waste line if required. The forward flight attendant panel shows the waste holding tank level when the indicator on push button is pressed. When a lavatory flush control system is an operative, a lab in Oplite will illuminate for that particular lavatory. The system in Oplite will illuminate when the waste holding tank is full, if the vacuum generator fails, or on the ground when the toilet service panel doors open.